Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining me today. My name is Ben Kenningsberg. I'm a cardiologist and intensivist at MedStar Washington Hospital Center in Washington, DC. And I will be talking about how to assess percutaneous axial flow pumps with cardiac ultrasound. These are my conflicts of interest. So goals for this talk, uh, by the end of the talk, I hope you understand the indications and contraindications for percutaneous axial flow pumps. Uh, you can identify um, the positioning goals for impella devices using cardiac ultrasound and understand how to troubleshoot impella devices using cardiac ultrasound. So what are percutaneous axial flow pumps? Uh, the um, brand name that is uh, widely available at this point is the impella, of which there are a couple different options. There are percutaneous impellas, uh, the 2.5, uh, which has a maximum of about 2.5 liters of flow via a 13 French introducer. The CP, which has a maximum of about four liters of flow via a 14 French introducer. The RP, uh, which provides right-sided right ventricular support, which is not the subject of this talk. In addition to that, there are the surgical cut-down devices, um, including the 5O, which provides about five liters of flow uh, with a 21 French motor through a uh, surgically placed graft, and the 5.5, which provides somewhere between five and six liters of flow at maximum uh, with a 19 French motor, again, through a vascular graft. And this is a representative image of uh, an impella superimposed on um, a cardiac ultrasound still image. And what we can see is that the device is positioned across the aortic valve from the aorta into the left ventricle. And that the overall function of this device, the goal of this device is to suck blood out of the uh, LV and to push that blood forward into the aorta. So why use percutaneous axial flow pumps? Uh, there are a couple of proved indications for these devices. One is high-risk PCI, or percutaneous coronary interventions, and that's uh, for the Impella 2.5 and CP. Uh, and then also for cardiogenic shock, which is primarily due to left ventricular failure, uh, and that is for all the um, different uh, variants of an Impella. So physiologically, the goal of these devices is to reduce myocardial work. Now, I will say up front, there is no prospective randomized trial that clearly demonstrates a clinical benefit. There are um, small trials, including this small multi-center trial that randomized 48 patients to a intraortic balloon pump versus an Impella CP for cardiogenic shock. And there was no difference in all-cause mortality at six months. There is also quite mixed observational data with some cohorts, such as the data on the left, uh, which um, is for peri-PCI support, which suggests harm. And there are other cohorts, such as on the right, which is a part of a protocol-based management of cardiogenic shock, which predominantly utilizes an impella device, which suggests benefit. So again, why use percutaneous axial flow pumps and why talk about them? Probably the most important is that the epidemiology of these devices has really changed a lot over the last decade. So since initial approval in 2008, the use of impella devices has grown significantly. On the left, we see the increase in growth and uh, use of these devices over the last decade for um, PCI that requires MCS. And on the right, we see uh, that a sizable fraction of patients who are in cardiogenic shock requiring MCS are supported with impella devices. So thus it's really important to be familiar with the ICU management of these devices. Uh, and really the positioning and troubleshooting these devices is, is what's critical to success um, when you're using them. I will say there are also ongoing trials assessing uh, mechanical circulatory support in cardiogenic shock and the timing of impella use for acute coronary syndromes. So more data to come. Now those are the indications. There are also important contraindications for the use of these devices. So an LV mural thrombus would be a contraindication as it, uh, a mobile thrombus could be dislodged by the intraventricular pump uh, and cause systemic embolization. Mechanical aortic valve is a contraindication as these devices must cross the aortic valve in order to uh, function. Same with severe aortic stenosis if it's severe enough to limit the placement of the device across the aortic valve. 
moderate to severe aortic regurgitation is a contraindication. Because again, these devices merely move blood from the left ventricle into the aorta. And if you have significant aortic regurgitation, that blood will uh, simply regurgitate backwards into the left ventricle, uh, which would not be providing adequate mechanical support. Severe peripheral arterial disease is a contraindication if it limits your vascular access, although uh, there are multiple different options for vascular access in this patient population. And then finally, I will also highlight ASDs and VSDs as there is a, a potential risk of increasing right to left shunting with these devices with a um, intracardiac hole. And I won't be uh, talking about these contraindications in, in great depth, uh, but I will note that baseline echocardiography prior to impella implantation is crucial to evaluate these, for these contraindications and also to potentially evaluate for other mechanisms for shock, including cardiac tamponade, depending on the clinical context. So let's move into the um, impella device itself. Here we can see that uh, in a graphic image, this is the important parts of the device. So starting at the tip, we have a flexible pigtail catheter, um, which is visible on ultrasound or can be visible on ultrasound. Um, more proximal to this is the inlet of the device and separating and identifying the distinction between the inlet and the pigtail catheter is an echogenic teardrop, uh, which is metallic, um, which is easily visualized on ultrasound. The inlet is where blood is sucked into the device through the cannula, which has a bend in it uh, as part of the transition from the left ventricle, the left ventricular outflow tract into the aorta. And then the outlet here is where the blood enters the aorta. The motor unit itself and the motor housing is located more superiorly than the outlet. And now this graphic superimposed on the anatomy uh, and a cardiac ultrasound, you can see how the device would be positioned with the outlet up here in the aorta and the cannula positioned and the inlet positioned into the left ventricle. So what are our goals, our positioning goals? Um, these are all important uh, goals to uh, um, uh, realize in the um, positioning of these devices. So one is a stable position in the mid ventricular space. If the device is sliding back and forth across the valve, you likely have too much slack in the catheter. And that is something that should be addressed. The catheter should be directed towards the left ventricular apex, not oriented medially or laterally or infralaterally. The inlet of the device should be free of the mitral subvalvular structures and the left ventricular walls to avoid um, challenges with inflow or suction events, as well as interference with mitral valve function. The distance from the aortic valve annulus to the mid inlet should be 3.5 centimeters, plus or minus 0.5. And the outlet should be in the aorta above the aortic valve. So if we've accomplished all of these positioning goals, the device itself should be working well. Although again, we have to keep in mind that there are potentially other problems of uh, ventricular, or valvular, or right ventricular function that could interfere with the device function. So how are we going to accomplish these positioning goals? Well, we can't do it by x-ray. So here's two representative um, x-rays of people with 5-0 impellas surgically placed. Uh, and although we can identify the presence of the impella device sitting in the aorta and across the aortic valve into the left ventricle, on x-ray, we cannot tell where the aortic valve is located, and we cannot um, clearly identify its intracardiac position relative to other cardiac structures. This is why cardiac ultrasound is crucial for positioning assessment of these devices. And here's a representative image where we can see the device, we can see it relative to the mitral valve, relative to the ventricular septum, the infralateral wall, the aortic valve, and we can make measurements from the aortic valve annulus to the mid inlet or to the teardrop. And again, 3.5 centimeters to the mid inlet from the aortic valve is the goal distance. So positioning tips, so this is very important. It can be challenging to get adequate images in, for the assessment of device positioning in these patients. The transthoracic parasternal long axis is the preferred 
image for depth measurements. However, it's important to note that off-axis views are often required to visualize the whole catheter and that being aligned well with the left ventricular cavity doesn't always get you the right image to be aligned with the catheter. So make sure to fan um, in multiple off-axis views until you get the best image acquisition. There are echogenic parallel lines, which represent the cannula, and these are also quickly known as railroad tracks, which we will look at. Um, those are important to help identify what part of the cannula you're looking at. Also, as we're looking at the, our image, we have to be careful that the echobright teardrop is what we're identifying and not the distal pigtail itself. Additionally, we can use color flow Doppler to check the outflow position. Um, and we can do that by looking for the artifact created by the motor unit. And finally, anytime we're looking at device position with ultrasound, we should also be thinking about the LV and RV volume status. What is the LV um, cavity dimensions? What is the right ventricular cavity dimensions? As this will um, be important in the appropriate clinical management of the patient and ensuring adequate preload to both the left ventricle and to the device. So again, here we see a representative image. We can see the echogenic parallel lines or the cannula railroad tracks, which are ending in this echolucent inlet port, followed by the echogenic or echo bright teardrop. And we would make our measurement here along this red line from the aortic annulus to the inlet. And this is a representative graphic of how color flow Doppler can help us. Uh, what will you do is you put your color flow Doppler box across the aortic valve um, and across the aorta, and you're looking for the echo artifact created by this motor unit. The artifact should always be completely above the aortic valve, as shown here on the left, since the motor housing is superior to the outlet port. On the right, we see the echo artifact below the aortic valve, suggesting an impella positioning too far into the ventricle. I'll also make a comment here about the Impella 5.5, as the positioning for this device is different than the other uh, Impella options. The distinction is that the cannula itself is longer for the Impella 5.5 from the bend in the cannula to the mid inlet. And as you can see, while there is a teardrop as well, there is no pigtail catheter for the Impella 5.5. However, just like other Impella devices, we can continue to interpret the echogenic parallel lines or the cannula railroad tracks, ending in that echolucent inlet port, followed by the echo bright teardrop, as well as the color Doppler motor, ar motor artifact. So here we see um, an impella positioned um, inside of the ventricle. This is an parasternal long axis view, although again, this is some real world acquisition and can show some of the challenges in getting adequate image quality. We do see the parallel railroad tracks. Um, we see that the device is in the left ventricle, but we cannot clearly see the teardrop, the inlet, and although we have a suggestion of, the, of something distally to the device, um, whether that is the inlet, um, whether that is the teardrop or the pigtail catheter is not completely clear on this image. When we reposition our echo probe, we can get a better image. And now we can more clearly see where the railroad tracks end, where the inlet of the device is, the teardrop, and then the pigtail catheter more distally. And here we can see now we have an adequate measurement of 3.8 centimeters, which is within the range of acceptable for this particular device. I should note, however, that at least on this image, the pigtail um, catheter is oriented towards the infralateral wall, and the device position may not be adequate um, on this particular image. We can also look at impella positioning on TEE, and the mid-esophageal long axis view is the preferred imaging um, view to make this assessment. Here we also see the impella catheter in the aorta quite clearly and crossing the aortic valve, 
but we don't see the device in the left ventricle well enough to make any meaningful measurements. With repositioning our imaging um, view, now we can identify the device much more clearly. We can see our railroad tracks. We can see what railroad tracks clearly end at the inlet port, and then we see the teardrop afterwards. In this case, our distance was 3.5 centimeters, again, right where we want it to be. We can make the same types of, me types of measurements uh, on the Impella 5.5, and this is another example of a well-positioned Impella 5.5 using the mid-esophageal long-axis view, um, again, identifying our relevant Impella anatomy and that the depth was five centimeters, which is precisely what we would want with this device. For, for Impella troubleshooting, there are important clinical events that may happen that should prompt evaluation of the device positioning. That includes suction events or ventricular tachycardia, as these may be due to myocardial contact, hemolysis, which may be due to obstruction of either ports, but particularly the outlet port, um, causing hemolysis and shear stress of blood passing through the device, and mitral regurgitation, which as I've said, can be due to interference with the mitral valve apparatus uh, and function. So what do we think of this device positioning? The device depth seems grossly appropriate and does in fact measure about 3.5 centimeters to the mid inlet. Additionally, the color artifact is appropriately above the aortic valve. However, note that the cannula is not oriented towards the LV apex at all, but is instead incorrectly oriented inferolaterally. And why is that a problem? Well, in the image on the left, we see mitral regurgitation which is due to this incorrectly inferiorly positioned impella cannula interfering with the mitral valve leaflets and apparatus. And of note, it's important to be careful not to interpret the echo artifact from the motor as regurgitant blood volume. Thank you.